You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies if it involves puts and calls then our all-star panel will break it down it's time to hit the option block with your host mark longo from the optionsinsider.com and co-hosts Alex, the Viceroy Jacobson from Options Express, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. That rock and tune means it is time once again for the Option Block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source for all things options related my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever expanding ever exciting options insider radio network beaming to you live from the uh, contagion central known as the options insider studios this week hopefully you guys out there in the listening audience wherever you may be listening particularly if you're here in the local Chicago land area have been able to avoid whatever plague is lurking particularly around the uh early childhood elementary school area, because if you have little ones uh, in school right now, you're probably dealing with this black plague as well that is striking left, right, and center. So far, I've been able to stay on my feet, but it has been a uh, a difficult battle, to say the least. I also want to mention at the top of the show, thank everybody who showed up at the Options Alliance event there on Monday. It was a fantastic event. Really great turnout, really great content, really great speakers and panelists, a lot of great networking, a really fun event, and it's always nice to have those kind of things pay off because so much work goes into them and it is a non-profit so it quite literally pays us nothing it just consumes a lot of time and resources on our part particularly a lot of our team here at the options insider that does double duty whenever there's options alliance events going on so a lot of work on behalf of myself and the team it was great to see that it all are really paid off well so if you attended out there in the listening audience thank you for showing up and showing your support and if you didn't hey We'll see you next time. It was a really fun event. Talking about a lot of interesting topics that don't get a lot of coverage here in the financial world or in really the the startup world. That is kind of the merging of the financial markets and the entrepreneurial space and what's going on there. And it's really interesting stuff and really no one else is talking about it. So we feel it's our duty to really beat that drum and get more interest in what startups are doing in this space, how financial entrepreneurs of all different types could be a tech startup, could be a financial advisor, RIA, asset manager, educator, whatever the case may be, a lot of different orientations out there, as well as how these guys go about getting funding and investment. We talked about that as well, which is a very, very uh, not touched upon, not broached topic at pretty much any event you ever go to. So always fun to kind of peek into those shadows and see what's going on over there in some of those less covered, but very interesting topics. If you missed it, if you couldn't attend, we're going to have the media from the event, particularly the video, available probably in the next week or so once we get it all edited and cut together. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in that information. You'll be able to find it at uh, optionsalliance.org, and we'll probably have it linked at Options Insider as well. So stay tuned for that. All right, and joining me 
on the old all-star panel this week, starting off with the man beaming in from the hinterlands of Chicago, known as scenic and sunny, and I'm sure it's about 85 degrees, warm and tropical, St. Charles, Illinois. It lives in its own little bubble out there. Of course, I'm talking about Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. Are you enjoying that tropical weather in St. Charles? Are you indeed in shorts and a t-shirt? Ah, it's neither warm nor tropical, and I'm in neither shorts nor a t-shirt. Long pants, long sleeves, so... um yeah, I think you got it wrong today. Typically, when you talk about the mountains, you know, I can I can go along with that, but it, it, we're not tropical. I was just trying, like I said, increase that tourism any way I can out there to St. Charles. Get it up to like six or eight this year. It might be huge. Hey, we're good enough for Mark Wahlberg and Jenny McCarthy. We're good enough for a tour. <laughs> there you go. The claim to fame of all things St. Charles. And beaming in from other hinterlands, from parts unknown, from out the suburbs of chicago you know him you love him as the viceroy mr alex jacobson from options expressed by charles schwab mr viceroy welcome back to the program sir hey mark good to be here and a uh, little bit of a schizophrenic day in the market today we were looking really good until the house delayed the uh the vote on the spending bill and i think all of us talk about the concern of the bozos in washington sort of uh gunking up the machine and today that's exactly what they did yeah, you can always rely on them to really uh, gunk up the works when necessary, and certainly seems like they did it again today. So I think without further ado, let's dive right into it and dive right into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block. Like the name implies, this is the portion of the show where they tell you what caught our eye, what was really lighting up the old tape, what was moving the old markets today. And like Alex alluded to, it was a fairly robust day in the overall markets. Most of the major indexes closing up substantially on the day. The Q is leading the charge up a full percentage point to 104.37 here. The S&P, of course, up about almost a full percentage point, just a hair shy, uh, closing today at 2,043. And, of course, the Dow, a bit of a laggard today, only up about three-quarters of a percentage point or so to about 17,660. We are recording this today, listeners, Thursday, December 11th, for all of you playing the home game, of course. And, yet, like Alex said, it was a lot of interesting stuff to really parse. We're going to get into that in a minute. But first, I'll toss it to each of my cohorts here on the old All-Star panel, see what really caught their eye. Maybe we'll start with you, Uncle Mike Tussauds. What caught your eye in today's activity? Not necessarily so much today, but just since the last time we've had this broadcast, I would say oil. I know I'm stating the obvious with that. Um, oil has obviously been in quite the pullback mode lately. Uh, curious to see if uh, OPEC, OPEC budges and uh, will kind of keep prices at the 60 level or around this level because I think it did drop below 60 today. Uh, overall, on the course of the week, uh, I would say it not to sound like too much of a pun man, but uh, it's been a slippery market uh, due to oil and grease. I think with grease coming down, I believe it was 10%. I forget it was, if it was Monday or Tuesday. Uh, the combination of those two things, I think, has really driven down this market. But with all that in mind, uh, we're still just a couple of percentage points off of our all-time high in the S&P. And so I remain bullish, as I always do, being the hopeless, pathetic bull with which I am. But nonetheless, I think that uh, energy is something to watch. And uh, well, today with uh, what Alex had talked about on the spending bill, we have a lot to look at over the course of these next few weeks going into the end of the year. And Mr. Alex, what caught your eye today in the activity, the swirling maelstrom of trading that was today's day, Alex? Well, in addition to what Mike talked about, uh, I, I'm obviously back in the house of many clocks and barking dogs. Uh, so we're going to put the dog back out. Retail sales and a perennial favorite on the desk at uh, OX, uh, Lululemon. Up almost five handles today, almost uh, six handles over the last couple days. Up $12 off its lows. But uh, the market started out on a tear today with the uh, the good retail sales numbers, and, and you, heard, you heard kind of the line that, that you've been hearing a lot lately. Lower oil prices, big dividend, confirmation now that that's going to come through to retail. Market was up a couple hundred points, and as the day went on, 
uh, the news just deteriorated, and the news wasn't the economic news that was deteriorating today. It was the political news. Uh, look at the 10-year, uh, under 220, 10-year at 217. Uh, but we're the highest rate in, uh, in terms of the larger Western economies. Now, Mike pointed out, uh, been a rough week for Greece, a rough week in China, an especially rough week in, in, in Russia. Kind of no surprise there. But uh, good retail numbers, and that gave us trade lift this morning. And then the bozos in Washington uh, took essentially 160, 170 points out of the market this afternoon. Yeah, and bringing up the spending stuff, it is actually surprisingly relevant to this program today, not just in the broad macroeconomic sense, but a lot of what tied up the discussion over the spending bill comes back to our neck of the woods. Indeed, derivatives, now I'm using the capital D kind of derivatives, the broad umbrella type of derivatives. A lot of people like to paint all of these markets with. We've talked on recent shows, had some listener mail about this specific topic, of course, about derivatives causing the crash and things like that. And we've clarified in the past, we typically talk here about listed equity derivatives, equity options, index options, and of course, some futures options as well. But primarily listed products, futures and options that trade on the exchanges have central clearing, had no real role in any of the meltdowns or crashes that happened in 2008. And what's going on now is some of the language Language in the spending bill includes provisions to force out a lot of that prop trading that caused a lot of the the issues in 2008, particularly at firms like AIG and others. They, they really weren't, didn't have a lot of oversight in what they were doing. They were taking on far more risk than they really should have, and that triggered a lot of other dominoes in the system that all kind of collapsed cons- consecutively. But what's going on now is there's some pushback on the ruling to essentially say, should they include swaps in that or not? There's also been a lot of pushback over the years about pulling proprietary trading away from those banks. And you could certainly see on the surface why a lot of people might think that would be a good thing because, of course, they don't, you sh- the government shouldn't be backstopping these big desks. If they want to take proprietary trading risk, that's fine. Why should the government be stepping in when it goes wrong? There's certainly a lot of mindset there. There's certainly a lot of public perception on that side of the fence. But, of course, a lot of people have been arguing recently as well that pulling some of those prop chaps away from the prop desks away from the banks has actually exacerbated volatility and reduced liquidity in a lot of the big products, including perhaps some of the big dramatic swings we saw in October in the markets and in the VIX could have been exacerbated by the fact that a lot of the big players in structured institutional products and big institutional products like VIX and SPX weren't playing or were playing to a lesser degree. And there's also the question whether or not this stuff, by forcing it away from the big banks that are now very heavily regulated, very high amount of oversight, if that's going to make a lot of this stuff get a little bit more obscure and a little bit harder to trace and regulate as a result. So there's a lot of back and forth on this, a very contentious issue, as you might uh, assume, and the Republicans and, uh, and the Democrats are going back and forth on what the language regarding the swaps should actually be. And that seems to be what has held up a lot of the final rulings here on the on the spending legislation, as well as what caused the market to perhaps wither a little bit towards the end of the day. Alex, what's your take on all this? I know there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's deep in the weeds here. You're talking about swaps, regulation, and things like that. But maybe on a more ten thousand foot level, the entire idea of pulling the prop trading away from the banks and perhaps segregating it out, whether it's derivatives or not, and whether that should even be something that the government should be entertaining as well. You know what? We, we all grew up in this business, and uh, this business has evolved to where I'm not sure why anybody would want to be a market maker anymore. And and I know that's kind of a uh, a brash statement, but um, liquidity in the markets haven't hasn't been good for a couple of years, and you get the events of. The, the the sort of mini crash we had this year, the flash crashes, you get some of these days where you look at stuff and say, wow, the S&P moved 20 points today. I didn't see any reason for it. Um, markets are thin. Uh, there was an even, there was a story today that ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, was already shopping the New York Stock Exchange, and they just closed that deal. Um you got to price liquidity. You got to give the dealers an incentive, you know, to make some money here. And the more you hamstring 
the 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 banking slash dealer community, the more liquidity you take out of this market. Um, you know, Mark, you just talked about the fact that the problem has never been the centrally cleared, transparent liquid products, and the centrally cleared, transparent liquid liquid products have less and less dealers in them every day because of some of these Dodd Frank issues and. and some of the bank that's saying, look, you know, we're we're, we're just not going to do this anymore and it's damaging our markets. Well, I think to add to that a little bit, Alex, the one thing that it does boil down to, you had mentioned last week in terms of what was caused, what had caused um, the crisis of uh, 2008, 2009 was people were in the wrong positions to where they were getting their bonuses uh, and they it wasn't their money, so to speak. And there's definitely a lot of that going on. I, I agree with you on that. And so what it boils down to with all of this, I think, is ethics. And if let's just say that I have no ethics whatsoever, and if I'm in a position to trade, and the only thing with which is at risk is the company money, and if I get a million-dollar bonus if I make a good trade, or I get fired if I make a bad trade, well, do about two or three of those trades, and I almost make as much money as Mark Longo in a day, then it's kind of one of those situations where I'm looking at the risk reward, not from an ethical standpoint, but just from just a pure monetary risk reward side for me. If I'm gonna make a million bucks on this trade for my bonus, but the worst that can happen is I get fired if I'm wrong, that's a problem. And so I think we just need to, I don't know if the government is necessarily the right answer to fix the problem because I'm, I don't really see how they, they're not going to know enough about how things work to step in and declare regulations because oftentimes they lag and things like that. But I think it just all goes, goes back to your point, Alex, of last week is that people need to be in the right positions to where if they mess up, then it's not the, uns the, um, it's not a, a messed up risk reward like we had back in 08, 09. Well, first off, you're dreaming, sir. If you think you're making as much as me in a day, I mean, seriously, come on. You're you're just this, that's just a pipe dream. Now we can. All... I said if I if I make two or three of those million dollar trades, oh, I make okay. almost as much as oh, you okay. in a day. Okay, I see. You're get, I can see now that's more in the realm of of possibility and logic. So sometimes we get pretty far afield in the show, but that was a flight of fancy of epic proportions. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you. Any anything below nine figures, you don't even bother with. I, I, I don't it. even get up in the morning. I can't be bothered, sir. Can't be bothered. <laughs> you know, but it is it is an interesting discussion point. That's why I wanted to bring it up on the show today, because it is indeed tangentially as well as directly related to the products we talk about here today. I would think hopefully a lot of the movement we've seen away from OTC and towards the centrally cleared stuff will solve a lot of this. Hopefully, anyway, a lot of the problem that was going on in 2008 is a lot of stuff was going on in marketplaces that were very opaque. They had very, very limited price discovery, very limited ability to value these positions they were actually putting on on an ongoing real-time basis and very little oversight as a result. When you have essentially cleared type, type environment like you have in the listed world, and I sound like I'm a commercial for OCC and CME clearing all those things right now, but those things worked. And so uh, at the end of the day, uh, those systems worked, and then you have the industry backstopping it and the risk as opposed to the government doing it. I think a lot of people will sign off on that as well because there's all this, you know, try to get the fat cat stuff. But at the end of the day, it's it's a serious issue that has a lot more beyond the surface than just, oh, we need to make sure these guys can't do this again. I think there's better ways to perhaps structure it than just forcing everything to be separate, as much as it might make you feel good uh, to do something like that, particularly all those people out there who were impacted by the 2008 meltdown and the housing collapse and everything else like that. Uh, moving on to some other products and other areas that Mike alluded to at the top of the show, one we've been touching on quite a bit, excuse me, here on the show as well. Of course, didn't have a show on Monday, and ever since our last episode a week ago, oil has done nothing uh, but continue to be active and volatile. Brent uh, crossed the $65 mark, 65 handle yesterday. That's the first time uh, since 2009 that Brent has got down uh, that low, got down that far. Uh, OPEC coming out saying they expect to see the weakest demand for their crude in over a dozen years. That's just crazy talk. Uh, so all those people, myself included, I put myself in that list as well, people who thought, well, once uh, once all the different products started getting into that 
80 handle or so range, certainly into the high 70s. The lion's share of this bearish sentiment had been spent, and all these people who were paying up through the nose for these ridiculous put premiums that were going on in the big oil options and in even products like USO and others, they were just crazy town, and certainly seems like they were perhaps a little more prescient than we gave them credit uh, for being. There was an interesting story that we had up on the on the website, the Options Insider. Of course, you guys, if you don't visit the site on a regular basis, we also have a lot of links to interesting outside stories that are of interest to big news in the world of options and derivatives, and we had a story up there from Bloomberg today and our, our friends Callie and them over there talking about uh, interesting disparity going on right now between a product we love to talk about and indeed malign on this show, of course, USO, that is kind of the retail staple for playing in the energy space, particularly when it comes to crude and things like that, as well as XL, another product we talk about a lot here on the old program as well. And they pointed out on, on Bloomberg, I believe this was today, talking about how there's an interesting discrepancy between what's going on out in one product versus the other. A lot of people think of those two products as being synonymous uh, at both ways to spec on the energy sector and what's going on indirectly out there in crude, and yet we're seeing uh, a very interesting difference in the way the options are shaping up in both. In USO, as you might expect, uh, we're seeing uh, serious, 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 serious premium to the puts out there, the puts are really just getting all sorts of bid up to high heaven, as you probably would expect, given everything that's going on out there. Uh, there is actually a, a put call ratio that's the highest pretty much since the summer, uh, about 40% more puts than calls, exactly what you probably would expect, given the market dynamics that are going on right now. And yet, it's kind of the flipping of the script for the XLE. It's actually, for XLE, the put to call ratio is at a nine-month low, uh, which is kind of surprising. And same thing going on with the uh, with the implied vol out here in XLE versus USO. Uh, the pr- implied vol out in USO is uh, hit a two year high recently of thirty six and a half. Of course, the, uh, the what we see out there in XLE is not at a two year high. So it, it is kind of an interesting bit of a disparity. I encourage you guys. Uh, to surf over and find this article. You can find it linked on theoptionsinsider.com or just search for it on Bloomberg Traders Hedge Oil ETF. While energy stocks lure buyers, they list up a lot of different discrepancies that are going on in there. But I think that speaks to a lot of what we talked about on this show. A, that USO kind of falls into the predictably crappy realm (laughs) of a lot of the ETFs we like to talk about slash malign here on the program, as well as perhaps maybe a little bit of a different use case uh, shipping up and, and shaping up for both of those two products, which is kind of interesting. Maybe Uncle Mike will start with you. I know you primarily watch USO, but you're not you're not immune to glancing over there at XLE as well. Have you had a chance to check out this article? And, and what do you think about these emerging discrepancies in the option flow and the vol of these two products? Well, I'm not much of a. I actually don't look at USO. Um, I'm more of an XLE type of person. Or if I'm looking at oil, I'll just look at the futures. Well, there um, we go. I've just maligned you completely, sir. So with that, well, you know, I I guess that's what I get for saying how poor you are, only making a couple million a day, right? I instantly tuned you out after that point. I am dead to you. Nonetheless, um, you know, I think that uh, what I like about XLE is that if I want to invest in an energy stock product and have some type of diversification, I think XLE fits the bill. I think it does a really good job with it. Uh, I'm very happy. I've, I've used XLE many times throughout the years, and I think it's it's a great thing with which you can use if you want to have exposure to the uh, energy stocks. USO, just be, I know we've talked about this a lot on the show, not a fan of it just because of the fact that it truly doesn't really give a true tracking of oil. And for my clients, if I want them to be have ex- direct exposure to oil, then I'll put them in oil or oil options uh, with the futures prefix CL. So that's kind of what my feeling is on oil and energy stocks in general. Alex, anything on this growing diversity here between these two products in the oil landscape? Well, I, I think we all agree USO is crap. Uh, and I think I can say that without Schwab compliance coming after me, uh, but probably not. Um, XLE clearly, did, you know, if, if somebody listening to the show wants to read up on this, the Bloomberg article was terrific, but also do a Google search under a guy by the name of David Lehrman, who's the marketing guru over at the CME on the energy products. And he and I have had this conversation a number of times on, on why the, the pure products, as Mike mentioned, the CL options 
are superior. The, the challenge the, the stocks have are, are the dividends. So from the short side, they're not an easy thing to short because most of the big energy stocks are huge dividend payers. And of course, the story that's coming into the marketplace now are, are they gonna cut their dividends? So I think what you're seeing is a significant amount of overwriting uh, of the XLE, which is what is impacting the, the skew a little bit. But, it, it, you know, it, it, it's pick what side you want to be on. If you want to trade the product directly, I, I agree with Mike. I go in the options on the CL, on the CME. Uh, it's the old Nymex. They're liquid. Um, they're reasonably deep. Uh, just be aware of when expirations are and what trading hours are. Uh, because uh, unlike the third Friday that we're used to in equities, uh, CL options are different. They stop trading earlier in the day, then they restart. But if it's a pure play, um, the Journal had a story today uh, and, and in some ways mimicked the Bloomberg story that they're starting to see activity in people buying the 95 and 100 calls on crude, thinking this is just a a small aberration and things could be popping back up. So don't like USO, would, would avoid it at all costs. Uh, to Mike's point, if you want to trade the equities, if, if you want to go out and pick the individual equities or you want to trade the ETF, ETF is a good vehicle. Let's keep an eye on those dividends, though. I think that's what's going on in terms of the, the actual stocks. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the calls. That's something we've been noting uh, on our volatility view show every week that traditionally the skew out there in the big oil options has just been pretty much a straight up investment skew for the better part of the past few months, just nonstop premium to the puts so over the past week or two, particularly since we saw that bit of a bounce in when when crude first got into the 60s and then pop right back. We started to see a little bit of life, not a ton, but you're right, a little bit of life uh, in the call wing, which is the first time we've seen any of that. If you if you went out there and graphed up the the implied vol skew in the big crude options, and we do that every week on that show, there was pretty much just a flat line or the better part of it out there on the call wing. And you're starting to see a little bit of a, of a tilt up now as people are actually starting to say, hey, maybe I'll, I will pick up a few of those. And it's kind of hard not to have that thought process cross your mind when, when crude is languishing in the mid-60 handle. Uh, and certainly looking at those puts dropping any further down, you're paying a serious premium to really to really get any downside spec on out there so if you are bullish out there i'm not saying that i am just saying if you are uh then there may be some cheap options out there pun intended uh, for you to investigate speaking of cheap options i was pulling some numbers up while mike and alex were talking here because uh, comparing con doing contrasting uso versus xle uh looking here pulled out i did about a month or so out a little more than a month out to get a little bit of good mix of some vol but also a little bit of gamma which i think a lot of people would be playing in the decent jan time frame right now if you're concerned about oil looking at about the five ten percent out of the money options here the puts here in uso they're trading at about a 50 from an implied vol perspective versus about a 38 from an XLE perspective. So an implied vol discount there. Ironically, both of them, even though one's at a, at a relative high, a USO anyway, neither of them really from an open interest perspective are screaming heavy puts versus calls. Even with the USO being at a, at a relative high here from an put call perspective, it's still only a one3 to one overall puts versus calls. You might think in this environment, it would be something more along the lines of like a VIX type product, like a four to one, something like that, where VIX gets very call heavy. Uh, XLE, a, a little bit higher, 1.5 to one uh, puts over calls, but still just not perhaps as much as many people would think given the preponderance of one-sided price movement we've had in oil of like, you think it would be two, three, maybe four to one puts over calls on those products. So Despite them hitting some record levels, still not perhaps as high as you might think. And it's interesting, nonetheless, to see the way those two products are shaping up. Speaking of the way things are shaping up, it's time for us to keep on rolling and see how some of this unusual activity was shaping up in the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right. 
right, listeners, you know what that funky tune means. It's time once again for the old Odd Block. And since I don't have my usual compatriots, my partners in crime for the old Odd Block, Andrew and Mark, Andrew is flying back away from this contagion-filled place back to scenic and hopefully disease-free Maine. I will instead rope in the Viceroy and Uncle Mike to join me here on the old Odd Block today. So guys, put your listening ears on as we dive into our first victim here on the old Odd Block. This is a newcomer to the old Odd Block. This is Dex Media Inc., ticker symbol DXM. Closing today, $9.72. Actually was a pretty banner day here for DXM. Closing up nearly 10% or about $0.82 on the day. So just a banner, banner upside day here for DXM. I'm not sure what was going on out here. I'll have to dig into it if there was a takeover, if there was earnings, what the deal was. But this stock was moving today. As you might expect, this is the name that does about 430 contracts a day. Not a ton. Today, doing about 10,500. So lighten it up today from an overall activity perspective. Talking about put calls and call puts. Today's activity, 969.3 to 1 calls over puts. That should tell you where the action was. A whopping 10,662 calls and 11 puts. So there you go. When you want to see some put call bias, just come to the odd block. We've got it for you. And all right, what caught our eye out here today was a bit of an old up and out. It appears to be on the surface. What first caught our eye was a chunk, a large chunk, (laughs) approximately 5,000 of the D9 calls, paper came in buying those uh, for sixty cents, and then they turned around and sold five thousand more of the Jan ten calls for thirty cents. So do the math at home, there, listeners. A net of thirty cents here to buy this spread and then roll it on out for the farther out strike. This looks like, given the open interest, 5,500 contracts on the DS9 strike, looks like this guy had a bit of an overwrite, and he didn't like the way the stock was moving today, at least against his call position. Didn't want his stock to get called away, so he decided to do the old up and out here, out to 10. Didn't move it that far, because he's, he's still precariously close to the at-the-money range. We're only about 30 cents away from that 10 handle now. Of course, when you have a a name like this, kind of a dearth of strikes, you have limited options, pun intended, when you want to choose where to roll to. Uh, But still, uh, an interesting one here from a guy saying, you know what, this name's gapping up, and we will not let our stock get called away. Instead, we shall play the old up-and-out game. Mr. Tussaw, Uncle Mike, if you will, I know that this is a game you are very familiar with here, having done this many times yourself on myriad cover call positions. What do you think of our friend here doing the old up and out on DXM? Do you like his strike selection? Do you approve? Or where does this rank on the old Tucson savvy scale? I like the up and out roll, but not after usually one or two would be my limit on that. Just because of the fact that what you're doing when you do the up and out roll, as stocks go up, typically volatility comes down. And this is from a general perspective, as I don't follow this stock, this uh, underlying very closely. So if it fool me once, okay, that's fine. I'll do the up and out roll. But after a while, you end up finding yourself rolling up and out to something that's you're still in the money when you're rolling up and out. And then you realize that your long call is three and a half years out on the leaps. And so you just kind of put yourself in a position to where uh, you're, you're not doing yourself any favors. So I like the up and out roll, but I think it needs to be limited to at most two up and out rolls. And then at that stage, I just say, let the stock get called away and we'll sell a put to get back in indeed sir that seems to be what our friend is doing we'll keep an eye here on good old dex to see if it keeps on rolling through this strike and if it does what our friend ends up doing if he just says oh the heck with it i'll let my stock finally get called away or if he decides to keep on playing the rolling game uh, we shall see either way interesting to watch we don't always see these guys come in and adjust them This guy, obviously, deciding that discretion was the better part of Valor, in his case, didn't want his stock to go away. And so he's playing a little bit more of the up and out. We'll see how that works out for him. Meanwhile, going to keep on rolling, pun intended, full of puns today. (laughs) You thought $9 was a little too rich for your blood? Well, don't worry. We got you covered here on the old odd block today. Next up 
is, I'm not sure if we talked about this one before. The name sounds familiar, but it's probably been a while. This is Sand Ridge Energy Inc., ticker symbol SD, closing today at a whopping $1.79. This is kind of the other side of the spectrum, down 20 cents or about 9.5% today. So the opposite side of the big banner up move we saw in Dex just a few minutes ago. So the name that does surprisingly decent amount of volume. Of course, you could argue that the stock is an option at this point. I'm sure Alex will. <laughs> so that's a name that does about 13,000 contracts a day. Does Did 26,000 today. So a lot of paper lighting it up today in Sandridge. And pretty much of that 26,000, 16,000 exactly came in this one fairly sizable, somewhat interesting trade we saw it going up out here. It's not the typical, you know, buy your call or what kind of thing we see. It actually was a size put sale to the tune of 16,000 of the March three puts for a buck 40. Now, if you're paying attention, that strike I just told you should let you in, clue you in on what else we saw that was interesting out here. That's a pretty deep in the money put to the tune of about. Well, stocks trading 180, so it's a buck 20 in the money right now. Uh, this trader coming in selling these puts for a buck 40. Pretty simple put call parity. Did them for 20 cents over here. It's an odd trade. We don't usually see them structured like this, selling a deep in the money call like that. Clearly, listeners, this is someone who's comfortable, of course, getting the stock. This is in many ways essentially. Uh, flipping of the script of a typical covered call. We say all the time, covered calls, short puts, identical. From a risk perspective, we'll hear someone bearing that out here in the marketplace, deciding, well, why go through all the hassle of the stock leg and the call leg? I'll just blast out the puts. I'll get 20 cents to do it, which if you look at where these calls are trading, they're 12 cents at 20. Pretty much sold the calls at the offer. Not a bad trade here from a, an overall premium perspective. And now he's playing the wait and see game to see how those calls work out, or excuse me, how those puts work out, and if he's picking up the stock, and if so, where he's doing it. But clearly, this is interesting. We didn't see any stock going up with this, like it was a tide trade or something along those lines. It was just straight up, pretty much as it appears on the surface. Someone coming in and blasting out a ton, sixteen thousand of these March three puts that are a buck twenty in the money for about twenty cents over. And drawing a very sizable line in the sand here. You could look at this and say, hey, this is clearly bullish here on this name. And one thing I would caution you on is that there is about 30,000 of 30,000 contracts open on this strike. And it is one of the more sizable strikes from an open interest perspective out here in March. The other one being the March 6 calls with about 26,000 open. So it is possible this person could be could be unwinding a portion of perhaps he is long some of these puts and unwinding them uh so we'll pay attention to the open interest tomorrow but on the surface it appears like this could be a uh, a straight up someone drawing a line in the sand uncle mike what's your take on this one this guy deciding to go the deep in the money put route rather than the covered call route well, I guess it's similar. It's the synthetic is just being long the stock and selling a far out of the money call. So I guess that's one way with which you could look at it. But um, usually it kind of makes me think that this might not be an opening move. Like maybe he got out of it recently and then wants to possibly get back in and get paid to get back in it type of thing. Because um, usually, at least in my experience, that's typically not an opening move selling a deep in the money put like that to get into a stock. Uh, so, and, and if you're really that bullish on the stock to where you think it's going to go up that much, uh, I don't know if I would want to sell a put that deep in the money. I would just simply buy the stock. Uh, but that's just me. But I suspect this is part I suspect that there's more to the story than what we are seeing in this. That's why we call it the odd block, sir. We will know for more tomorrow when the OI numbers come out. You guys playing the home game, you can let us know your bets as well. There is a good chance it is indeed closing here as well, which will... It's interesting either way we parse it just to see these these big trades going up in such far, far out of the money options. Speaking of out of the money, we're going to wrap it up with... A more traditional odd block narrative. This is coming up in Whiting Petroleum. Bit of a theme here today. A lot of energy names in the old odd block. Surprise, surprise. Ticker symbol WLL for this one. Closing today, $28.98. Down about a buck or 3.6% 
on the day. It's the name that does about 4,300 contracts a day, doing 18,000 today. Very robust day here for Whiting as well, with not from an options volume perspective, not from an underlying upside perspective. And what caught our eye today was out here in the Jan expiration cycle, but not just any Jan. Uh, these are... <clears throat> All right, what caught our eye out here in good old Whiting is some upside call activity out here in the Jan expiration cycle, in particular the Jan 35, as we profiled these on the site this morning. Paper coming in buying about 8,300 of these for a buck 90. Went up on a couple of different blocks. Uh, looks like this is essentially as it appears on the surface a large swing for the fences. To the upside, some substantial out-of-the-money calls going up here. Paper buying in WLL. Didn't see any stock. Uh, didn't see anything else that would give us any sort of uh, expectation. Something else is afoot. Open interest, only 1,100 contracts on this strike. So clearly opening paper. Uncle Mike, why don't you take us home with this one and say what exactly... Your, what's your take on these guys coming in, just like this trade, for example, where they're just loading up to the upside here in good old... Out of the money, not that cheap, actually, calls here in this name, Whiting Petroleum Corp. Hey, have a hunch, bet a bunch. Energy is down, why not? Um, I think it's either that or this could be, uh, like we always say, in terms of there being more to meet the eye, this can always be hedging a short position. Let's say that you're uh, short Whiting Petroleum and you have a decent profit on it, let's say, not knowing when this entry point would be on the stock. But uh, if that's the case and you want to maybe protect some of your gains, that would be another way of doing it. It wouldn't surprise me if this is just someone coming in and wanting to take a wild bet on it. But I think this is more of a hedged style play of uh, something else that could be in the works. Indeed. Could be a short size seller here saying, I need some upside to protect against the worst coming to pass. That certainly is a use case we see often as well out here in the old odd block. A lot of different things to parse and, of course, for you guys to keep an eye on as you're playing the home game there while we keep on rolling right on into the Express Block. The Express Block, brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading. From advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources, Options Express by Charles Schwab is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account. On powerful, yet easy use trading platforms including mobile devices visit optionsexpress.com for your free account options express by charles schwab is a member of finra sipc and nfa all right everybody welcome to the express block this is indeed like the man said the portion of the show where the viceroy takes us behind the scenes into the land known as options expressed by charles schwab gives us some insight into what was cooking what was lighting up the old tape over there as well as what some of the questions that customers are asking, as well as some of the cool things they have coming down the pike over there. A lot of cool stuff coming out of the land of OX. And Mr. Alex, it shows you what a busy day it was and how much oil and other things are taking top of mind these days, is that today was Lululemon Earnings Day, a name that is near and dear to the hearts of many OX clients and customers, and yet we haven't even touched on it. But I'm sure OX was lighting up the tape over there. OX, listen to me. I'm sure Lulu was lighting up the tape over there at OX today. Yeah, that that was probably one of the primary themes today. I mean, energy continues to be a, uh, a, a real theme, and there's lots of trading going on. Uh, in the futures options and in the underlying energy names. In fact, yesterday I was down on the futures desk. I, I was down on the 10th floor for a little bit, and I stopped to talk to Mike Zaremski, who runs our futures desk. And he was saying that um, October, November had been our biggest futures months in the history of the firm. And then he kind of paused for a moment and said, December's going to... Uh, be even bigger than those. Uh, that was his expectation. And December, clearly the theme has been energy. October, November, we had lots of vol in the market and lots of e-mini trading, uh, which, which uh, 
you know, was kind of top of the book on the future side. But December has been energy. But Lululemon is kind of interesting because Lululemon, if you look at the, the volume numbers in 2012, 2013 on the on the OX desk, Lulu was probably the second largest equity name on the desk, second only to Apple. And of course, in 14, it it kind of went really quiet. The stock sold off from the 60s down into the high 30s area. Lots of bad news. And I knew something was up because Grigas, John Grigas, who runs our trading desk, was back in his yoga outfit today. So to me, that 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 had to be a clear indication. Uh, stock had earnings today and retail had good numbers today. So Lulu's good earnings kind of had a, a, a tailwind today coming off retail. Stock is up about $12 off its lows at around the 3940 area. It was up five bucks today. There's there's a lot of Lulu stock sitting in the Options Express accounts. So now the stock has come off what, what I used to call the living dead list. And the living dead list were, you know, people who had positions in stock that maybe would manage them with, with options, overwriting them or maybe selling some puts against them. Uh, you know, lightening up in, in rallies and buying on dips. And then when Lulu kind of took out that 50 number and got into the 39 number, it, it, it kind of went dormant. And that's what I mean by living dead, where people are just going to sit on it. Uh, they're not going to do repair strategies or anything until it gets back up near their cost basis. And that's part of what was driving the desk today. But there were a couple other themes Facebook has picked up again. Facebook added a couple points today. And the social networking triplets, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and Twitter, had gone a bit quiet in the last couple weeks, uh, especially Twitter had gone quiet. Uh, another theme today, and, and this was an OX theme. I don't think it was industry-wide. Uh, but Wynn Resorts, the, the gambling firm, which has just gotten murdered lately on the, the, the Chinese economic news, the expectation that uh, gambling in Macau, where Wynn has a big presence, uh, will decline as the Chinese economy cools a little bit. Saw some body, uh, bottom fishing in there today, and that stock and added a couple handles. Um, but as many of the Chinese-related stocks, it had been trading... Uh, off its lows today, and we saw a little bit of activity in there. Yeah, one is an inter interesting one, certainly an opportunity for potentially, if you think this thing is going to turn around, some bottom fishing or catching a falling knife, I guess, depending on your viewpoint out there. But that one is well off its highs of north of 240 into the 250 range uh, back in earlier even this year, trading today one just here shy of 150 after having rallied about 2% today. So a bit of a bump for that one. But yeah, definitely on the on the low end of that trough for win. So if you're interested in that one, maybe that's an idea for some potential upside. I'm not sure if the Idea Hub is spitting out any good ones out in that. Actually, probably not because there's no no individual VIX in that one. Uh, but still, an interesting interesting stuff. And Lulu, of course, interesting. I'm still kind of trying to get my head away from that image of John Grigas in the in the yoga pants. Hopefully, he opted to avoid the very sheer ones that he, Lululemon got in trouble for a year or so ago. Hopefully, he went for the nice, dark, very opaque ones to keep all things covered. Yeah, John is always tasteful in his attire. <laughs> well, he is a Schwab MD now, so a certain level of decorum, I believe, is expected. Certainly not the sheer yoga pants. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Alex. A lot of interesting stuff cooking over there at OX today. Interesting to see that uh, Facebook also uh, charging up the list again. Lulu doing, as we might expect, some serious numbers today. It's been averaging, you're right, pretty pretty light. Only about 12,800 contracts a day of late, doing 90,000 today. So about 2.3 calls over puts in today's activity and about 1.6 calls over puts in the open interest out there. I'll give you a hint, though, the net delta is all very long today and a lot of interest in the calls out there in Lululand today, looking at the weeklies and some of the other months. And there's activity and just you pick a strike 
uh, there's someone out there playing uh, all sorts of uh, interesting stuff afoot out here in Lulu. So maybe that one will be back on the on the radar again after having uh, dipped into quiet period for a while. There, we keep an eye on Lulu while we keep on rolling right on into. Uh, we'll do a real quick mail block because it is Thursday. I want to make sure you guys have some time on the show as well. So without further ado, it's time to open up the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody, welcome to the mail block. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where you guys get your chance to shine here on the old program, make your questions and comments known to us. No shortage of ways for you guys to get in touch with us. I won't illuminate them all now. It'll take far too long. Meanwhile, we'll just dive into our first question here. From Nico Bellick, he writes, question for the Option Block program. There are many options exchanges in the U.S. all trading the same products. How does this affect the way options trade in the U.S.? Is this more of a problem or a benefit to options traders? Anything I need to be aware of there? Well, it's an interesting question, Nico, a topic we've touched upon many times here on the program in the past. It is a bit of a contentious issue. kind of depends where you're coming to the issue from. Uh, for the perspective of a lot of industry participants, this a large amount of fragmentation is not exactly desirable. As you can imagine, the cost of connecting to all of these different facilities, the expenses associated with hooking up to their technology, the expenses of keeping up with their myriad fee schedules. Each of these venues charges a different fee or rebates a different fee for trading options. So it's a very, very confusing, very Byzantine system that has come up. And you're right, they all are, for the most part, with a section of the SIBO, really trading all of the same products. So you can get your Apple in anywhere of a dozen different exchanges. It kind of the benefits start to become de minimis after a while of adding yet a new one. Yet in Q1 of next year, we will be adding a 13th when the ISC adds their third exchange to the family. So there still are people out there beating the drum for new exchanges. From the, from the viewpoint of a retail guy like you, it can be a little bit of a problematic, particularly if you're trading spreads as we advocate here on this program we talked about many times on the show in the past if you're doing anything simple verticals more advanced multi-leg spreads uh, you may encounter this fragmentation issue as you're trying to execute those spreads where your order is routed to one exchange's spread book and those exchanges those spread books don't talk to each other because they want to keep those orders on their spread book and on their exchange to get executed so you have an issue where maybe your spread is offered or bid away and you're on a different exchange spread book and you can't get routed over there in time or maybe it just sits there and you miss the offer or miss the bid so it's a very very frustrating thing for a lot of retail traders out there people are working on ways around it firms like ox have, have worked on ways around it some of the exchanges like isc have built in implied functionality to try to help some of those issues but there still isn't a lot of connectivity amongst the exchanges which really needs to be to get that spread execution problem down. Uh, Alex, what do you have to say here for our friend, Mr. Bellick? Is it a, a problem or a benefit to have so many exchanges out there these days? So it's, it's both a benefit and a curse. And as someone who comes from uh, having worked at two of the largest exchanges, the good news is there's lots of competition and there's lots of innovation. The bad news is now I work at OX, and they've got to write code to 13 different exchanges. They've got to protect your order on 13 different exchanges. I got a call this week. Uh, the trading desk called me up and said, customer wants to talk to you. Uh, had a Cisco spread, and the spread was $0.71 cents to $0.76, cents and uh, got filled at 71 didn't get price improvement. Part of the issue was one of the legs of the spread was on an exchange that didn't trade spreads as spreads. So then the router, in a sense, has either got to uh, break that up, which then you run the risk of markets moving. So it, it, it's a good thing in the sense that there's terrific competition, terrific innovation. I mean, look at the Amex. Five years ago, the Amex was dead on arrival, merged with the New York spent some money on innovation. Uh, Amex, when you and I were growing up in this business, Mark, was the spread exchange. Um, the challenge is these, the little exchanges that do two or three share points, and now you've got to protect orders on those exchanges, and you've got to write code to them, and it just makes it phenomenally expensive. So it's both a blessing and a curse. I, 
look, in 2000, the CBO had a monopoly on index option trading and probably a 70% share overall. And it cost customers typically exchange fees then were about a buck. So at Schwab, the commission rate back then was $29.95 and $2.50 a contract. Think about it today. Today you have rebating payment, payment probably in the neighborhood of 30 cents on non-monopoly products, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. And you've got people trading for dollar a contract, some people trading for less than that. So it's been a mixed blessing, but both uh, a blessing and to uh, a lesser degree a curse. Tucson, anything to add to that, sir? No, I think Alex pretty much said it all. Um, it's definitely come a long way since that time. And then the pioneers of this business, such as Alex, do remember the time that uh, the costs were much higher and that uh, as a retail trader myself, I think that costs being lower is obviously a good thing. Uh, but uh, like Alex said, you have all these other exchanges. So I think it's, it, it's good and bad. I think he's absolutely right. Yeah, the one point in the good favor, there aren't many. Alex mentioned the competition. The other one, of course, people complain that it may cause a lot of these technological issues having so many different exchanges to connect to. On the flip side, when one exchange does have an outage or even two or three, you got another dozen out there that you could route to. So it doesn't really impact uh, unless something like Opera goes down. Then that's a different story. But still, so when there's an issue at one or two exchanges, chances are it won't dramatically impact you unless there's something really odd going on there. Uh, so that's probably one of the few benefits of having this massive explosion of trading venues is that you can actually get liquidity even when one or two of them are having problems. All right, good question, Mr. Bellick. And now we're going to roll on into a very, very quick around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, you guys know what that sound means. It's time for Around the Block portion of the show. We tell you what we're watching for the rest of the week into the weekend. Uncle Mike, we shall start with you. What's catching your eye for the rest of this week? Obviously, crude. What else is catching the eye of the old Uncle Mike? Crude 60, S&P 2000, Apple 110. Those are the key numbers with which I will be honing in on. I like it. Very succinct. It's like you've done this before. Once or twice. <laughs> Mr. Viceroy, what's catching your eye for the rest of the week, sir? I would add two numbers to Mike's list. Uh, VIX 20, uh, a surprising pop in volatility this week. Um, the other thing is the U.S. 10-year. We're the, we're the, right now the highest rate of the, the sort of deep liquid, I don't want to call them the Western democracies, but uh, basically we yield more than just about anybody, uh, and, and I'm not putting the you know, grease in there. But our tenure right now is uh, almost four times the German rate. We're above the Italian rate. We're above the Spanish rate. Uh, we were most of the year, us in the UK, were about the same. We're 20 bips over the UK right now, and we're five times the yield in Japan. So watching uh, our rate, I expect us to hold the 2% yield but if we crack two, it gets real interesting. Well said, sir, as the devoted macro head that you are known to be. All right, it's going to do it here for the old Around the Block segments. Also going to do it for this episode of the Option Block. Really quickly, let's check back in with my cohorts here to see what they have coming up that may interest you. Starting off with you, Mr. Viceroy, what's coming up in the land of OX? Uh, our last live event of the year this Saturday in Boca Raton, Florida, meet Jimmy Ruzan. And his crew, Jimmy's a former SIBO market maker, does about a three-quarter of a day event. And I know he's working his schedule for next year. We'll be promoting that on upcoming shows. But Jimmy's in Boca this weekend. On Monday, Nina's going to do a platform and site tour, talk about a number of the new features on the trading platform on Tuesday Nina's going to do part of her ongoing series. She does sort of this continuation of education, and she does it topic by topic. On Tuesday, she's going to do short calls. On Wednesday, Mike Zaremski, who runs our futures trading desk, is going to talk about trading futures and futures options. And I know we've all talked about the phenomenal growth 
in the futures options business. If, if you're looking at trading things like crude, I think the best way to take the bite out of that apple is with uh, the options on the crude contract. And Mike's going to be doing a webinar on that on Wednesday. Funny how the year always seems to end there in the south, the warmer climes. Funny how that happens. Never the Minnesota December event. <laughs> how about that? Yeah, amazing how that works. All right. Oh, and before we go, of course, Uncle Mike, you guys just had the big event. How did that go in Miami, another southern event? And what else is coming up in the land of RCM? Oh, the event went great. Um, just in terms of the, the rest of 2014, we are done with events, and we are encouraging people to spend time with your families and eat as many Christmas cookies as you possibly can. Uh, but we will have a full slate of a lot of things going on in 2015, so stay tuned. Looking forward to that. Surf on over to the RCM site, different sites, wealth management, uh, futures to learn more, all the cool stuff they have cooking. And the boys couldn't make it today, but surf on over to optionpit.com as well to learn about all the fun stuff they have there, the various webinars and boot camps and what have you cooking over there in the land of Option Pit. And I'll be had one more time. I'm going crazy today. And on behalf of Uncle Mike and the Viceroy and, of course, myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and for making us such a success. And we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The Option Block was brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Confidence, stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.